Welcome to the Old Capital Real Estate Investing Podcast with Michael Becker and Paul Peebles. During this program, you will hear interviews with real-life successful investors who will share their stories and provide useful advice on how to acquire, finance, and operate apartment complexes. Now, here they are, Michael Becker and Paul Peebles. Now we have the great privilege of having Casey Conway on the line with us. And Casey, I am going to let you um, share your screen. Here's a little bit of his background. Essentially, has been in the business for a long time, 35 years in commercial real estate, and has done pretty much everything. Appraiser, economist, director of research. And I'm going to turn it over to him. Casey. All right. Thanks, James. Hope you all right. are... Hope y'all are doing well and had a good Thanksgiving and uh, and whatnot. So we'll just jump into it. I'll echo a few comments I heard in the discussion beforehand about North Carolina. So the Carolinas are a very good market. So I put them right up there with Salt Lake City. Go go to Salt Lake City and San Antonio. They're three of my top five markets. So we'll talk about that a little bit. So here's my disclaimer slide. So you're all protected. We'll flip past that. <clears throat> so I recently presented to the Global Conference with CCIMs and. You know, I had an opening perspective, I always have one, and thought I'd be honest and show you what I was thinking about at the beginning of this year. So in January, my focus was on on pitcher influences. Who cares about whether the glass is half full or empty? It's who controls the pitcher at the bar because that'll determine whether whether your glass is half full. And so some of the things that I thought were that pitcher influence were Boeing, and we we just got some good news on um you know, on Boeing that uh, they're lifted to fly again. And um, again, they're going to consolidate all that 737 construction to um, South Carolina. So that's good for the Carolinas. LIBOR transition. So you're talking about your financing. Uh, that issue has not gone away. We're in the one year away countdown to LIBOR transition. So anyway, so those are some of the issues. So where we're at right now is we all hope that the November elections end in November, but they didn't. <laughs> and so I put some dates here that we all might want to keep on our calendar. December 8th is the date when they call it Safe Harbor Day. All the states have to certify their elections. So that's going to be interesting to see what happens I think next Monday or Tuesday. I think it's Tuesday. The 14th, the Electoral College actually votes. So we get to do elections all over again. <laughs> and then they count the votes. It takes them a long time after they vote to count their votes. There's so few of them. It's less than a thousand. They count the votes on January 6th. Let's hope there's not a recount, <laughs> that everything can work okay. Um, the big issue is you're going to seek the Congress on January 3rd. We don't know what the Senate's going to be because us here in Georgia can't figure out how to vote either and uh, figure out what our Senate composition is going to be. So a lot, a lot of stuff uh, going on there. So where I think we're headed for this next year is, you know, one of my famous books I might have shared with you in the past is Seussisms. You know, it's a great guide to life, you know, kind of common sense type of stuff. You know, hang around with good people like you're doing tonight. Get good advice, hopefully, like you're getting tonight. You know, expect the unexpected. Make a plan, you know, study um, and focus. So that's kind of my opening perspective. But if you don't like that one, here's one that will blow your mind. I've, I've mentioned to a lot of folks and colleagues that I'm a big fan of visual capitalists. So they're great at visualizing data. And so they just put this one out after Thanksgiving that it even has my mind a little blown. I encourage you to go look at it. But a lot of stuff going on. They look at blaming news events and what happened with the S&P 500 to COVID case count. Look in the middle there, what happened in July. So in July, we decided the stock market's no longer going to go down. But COVID cases continue to skyrocket. What was the bifurcation there? You know, I think was it everybody thought, well, whether states are, are open or not, we're just not going to completely close them again. Um, but there is so much packed into this thing. I really encourage you to go to this website. They've got a ton of other charts and graphs to study it. But if you want to get prepared and get your mind blown for what to expect in 2021, this is a, this is a good one to do. <laughs> All right. So, you know, I always start with what's going on with the COVID virus. You guys have been wrestling with it as one of the top states and now the top state with it. And I think it's important to know what's going on with the virus because it's going to dictate where occupancy restrictions go. Uh, so to your neighbors, to your, you know, north and west and east, what happens and who you do business with. And so you guys are number one. So guess what? Nobody wants you to come visit them for Christmas. <laughs> no, no planes or trains from Texas for Christmas. California is two, Florida three. So you can see these big states, Georgia, we're up there at number six. 
hey, the Carolinas, North Carolina is, you know, in there at number 13, but South Carolina is down in the 20s. So you wonder why things are going so well. You can escape there. You can move around and the virus isn't so bad. So um, pay attention to this. This is really going to dictate how our, how our next first part of next year plays out. All right. This is an interesting one. And again, my friends at Visual Capitalist did this. They broke out the state GDP declines um, across the country. And, you know, if I asked you, even if I asked myself before I saw this, what would you guess are the two top two states in terms of GDP decline because of COVID? And my natural gut instinct was, oh, it's got to be New York, New Jersey, California. Well, even the Red Shoe Economist was wrong. <laughs> it was Nevada and Tennessee. And so what do both those states have in common? Well, they're big leisure and travel markets. Think of Nashville and the country music and think of Memphis and the barbecue and, you know, the Peabody Hotel and, you know, all the history there. Think of Las Vegas and Nevada. But there's another thing that each have. Tennessee's a big manufacturing state. So when you shut down all the automobile manufacturing plants in April and May and even part of June, that had a big impact on their economy. And in Nevada, it's mining. So huge mining stuff, and even the auto and mining industries are still impacted because you can't get the labor in there. You can't run you know, three shifts, two shifts a day. So if you wanna know who had the least decline in GDP, well, it'd be um, Salt Lake City and, and, and Utah. They actually have the lowest, that's where you need to go skiing. Don't go to Colorado, go to Utah. <laughs> I'm a native from Colorado. And second was Arizona. And then you can look at, you know, uh, Georgia and Alabama, we were just under 30%. So this is important because it tells you what to expect in terms of state fiscal health. That's what we're going to talk about in a minute and, um, and how things can kind of get done. So again, paying attention to where COVID goes and paying attention to GDP decline is going to kind of like the dominoes is going to affect fiscal health. It's going to affect transaction activity and everything else. So this is a great one to watch. All right. Believe it or not, manufacturing is coming back. It We need to pay attention to where it is strongest, most like our supply chain. And so you can see you guys there are number three in the country for manufacturing. South Carolina and Tennessee are number one. So manufacturing, and it's not just in the petrochemical and the oil industry, it's in, in a lot of other things, um, automobile as well, medical equipment, devices. So you know, if you can't, if you have occupancy restrictions, you can't get your workforce in there, that's going to affect your overall economy. But um, this is pretty good good news that um, you guys are a manufacturing power. And I think more of that comes your way uh, with reshoring, uh, regardless of the political elections. I think corporate America is really going to drive that reshoring because they can't have their supply chain disrupted like it's been. So regardless of whether Biden continues tariffs, lets them all go, opens up the borders, I think corporate America is, is going to say we're going to get more control of our supply chain and we're going to put it here in America. So here's an example of where it's where it's already happening. Those of you that do deals in San Antonio, one of my five top market picks for the country. Uh, so Salt Lake, San Antonio, Phoenix, the Carolinas, Columbus, Ohio, believe it or not, you know, these are some of my top picks, but this was uh, Navistar announced a deal during uh, COVID here back in October. So they're bringing a big manufacturing facility that'll open up in spring of 2022. So those 600 new jobs are going to need a place to live. They're going to need mortgages or apartments. So, you know, believe it or not, business and site selection decisions are being made. Look at even CBRE said, we've had it with California. We're coming to Texas. Um, we're not going to pay those exorbitant taxes anymore. And we're going to bring, even though a lot of the executives were already there in, in Dallas and Texas, uh, they said, well, maybe because it's so good for us, we should let the rest of the workforce come here too. So um, good stuff happening in your state. All right. I'm not going to show you the jobs numbers because the BLS, the numbers are a mess. They don't know what they're doing in the CARES bill. For the first time ever, it allowed 1099 workers and, and sole proprietors to be included in unemployment and collect unemployment insurance. So that spiked the numbers like we've like we've never seen before. That's why we saw a 20 million person spike in April and into May. And they're still trying to figure all that out. And then if you were a sole proprietor and you didn't fill out your paperwork and where you were interviewing for jobs in May, you got dropped out. They pulled 9 million people out in June and July. So the numbers are just a mess. So ADP does a good job. We'll get all of those numbers this week. But Challenger Gray and the job cuts is what I'm looking at. This is your forward indicator. And so we know we've only rehired about half of what we let go in March and April. 
Uh, so of the 21 million, only about half were rehired. So on top of that, we have over 2.1 million job cuts that have been announced for end of December and in January of next year. So on top of the 11 million that are still unemployed, we're going to throw another 2.1, 2.2 million people. So you need to pay attention to that. So I broke out the Western region here. Believe it or not, you guys have had to cut a lot. And a lot of these have been in the energy industry. But California leads and you guys are number to look at those numbers on California, almost 400,000 job cuts this year in California alone. So a lot of years have been influenced by the energy sector. So in places like San Antonio and Austin with technology, San Antonio with the Port of San Antonio and the, and the military, not as significant a situation. So that's, that's good news. So pay attention to this. This is your forward-looking indicator. All right. Another one that's important for you guys is the transportation metrics. So you've got ports, you got, um, you know, Port Houston, which does a lot of the uh, petrochemical and the, and the energy, but you also have Port Freeport. In Port Freeport, in, uh, down near Roseburg and south of Fort Bend County, it's becoming to Dallas what the Port of Savannah became to Atlanta. So all of the GM uh, SUVs and trucks that are manufactured or brought down to there and all the you know Chiquita bananas that we eat come in through that port. It's becoming a very important non-petrochemical uh, oil and energy um, port. Um, so pay attention to that. Um, if you do anything in Fort Bend County, uh, just put a Nike swoosh by it. Just do it right away. But on the left here is the TSA passenger count. So this is an index. Um, that tells us how many of us are flying every day. And so I started talking about this back in April when it shut down to 85,000 people a day. We used to have two and a half million people a day going through our airports. April went to 85,000. It's climbed back here in the fall to the six to 800,000 range. We've had yet a good spike here for the Thanksgiving holiday up to 900,000 to a million, but still these numbers are only 30 to 40% of what was normal pre-COVID traffic. And the airlines need about a million eight passengers a day to break even. And so all of their financial support uh, ended end of September. So they've been waiting for a fiscal deal and they're barely hanging on. Delta and Southwest have cash to make it into 2021. I don't think that American does. Um, they're over leveraged. They bought all new planes last year and United is pretty stressed. So what's gonna happen, whether they file bankruptcy or not, they're gonna start massively cutting route structures. And so you guys need to be thinking in your non-Dallas and Houston markets, what happens if routes are cut to different you know, secondary markets in Texas and what does that have to do? So pay attention to that metric. On the right is all good news. So this is the rail traffic numbers and they're telling us that our supply chain is getting back to work. Uh, April was a record low in 30 years for rail traffic. And we just concluded the month of October and it was the record high that we had. So this is good news, manufacturing, supply chain, port activity, all of that is renormalizing. So very good news, you're a big logistics and port and rail and transportation state. So that's good news for your state. I wanna talk a little bit about fiscal health. Very important because as all of our states and our, and our local governments wrestle with what to do in terms of occupancy restrictions, they need to understand where their revenue comes from. And so this map on the left is, an, is one from the Tax Foundation where and they just updated it today, it's still about the same. And it looks at what states are most dependent on sales tax as a percentage of their total revenue. Look at Nevada and Arizona that have had the biggest drops in GDP. They're incredibly dependent upon sales taxes, up to 40% or more. So when you, when you shut things down and you don't let retail and you don't let restaurants and you don't let bars and you don't let hotels be open, you've just cut 40% of your revenue flow. And states are starting to realize this now and they got no more fiscal health. And so there is no stimulus that'll happen at the earliest until February or March of next year. So we have a real tough bridge to go from really the, the, the fall or winter here through the winter into spring next year. So looking at where you guys are, you can see Nevada, Arizona, Tennessee have the highest dependency on sales taxes. Texas, you're in the middle at about 34, 35% but it's material. So, you know, you need to understand how that plays out in your state. On the right looks at what's happened just through through May in terms of state revenue declines. So the national average was 29%. And um, 
uh, Texas was right there with it. Um, Alaska and California were the worst at over 40. New York and New Jersey down 37%. We are facing very severe fiscal situations. So as you're looking at deals and talking about deals with your clients or you're talking about financing, one of the things to put on your radar screen is looking at fiscal health. We've already started to see counties uh, file Chapter 9 bankruptcy. And when I was at the Fed last time, we had over 74 county and city bankruptcies in the 2009 um, recession. Uh, most of those were in 2010 and 11 and 12. My forecast is over 100. So we have about 360 MSAs in the country. And we're looking at almost a third of those filing Chapter 9 bankruptcy. How do you finance real estate? How do you trade real estate when, you're, when your county or your city files bankruptcy? And let me tell you, from the Fed and the banking perspective, it's, it's very difficult. So pay attention to that. He's thinking about that. The first one that filed was outside Birmingham, Alabama over the summer, Fairfield, Alabama, or outside of Birmingham. But we're going to see a bunch of them. I'm working with two counties here in Metro Atlanta right now that are on the verge of bankruptcy. And this time we could see big, big cities. I think New York is very at risk of going back to the 1970s in filing bankruptcy. So um, that's why this fiscal stuff's important. Here's the Fed balance sheet. This is some good news for you guys. And it's bad news for all of us in America. The Fed's balance sheet in the last seven months has grown from 3.2 trillion to over 7.2 trillion. And the Fed doesn't manufacture or sell anything. It simply um, calls Treasury and says, print me some money. And so it's very inflationary uh, from a currency standpoint. It's devaluing the dollar. We've printed, we've devalued um, our currency to the point of we've increased the money supply by 20% in the last 90 to 120 days. So you can see that impact. The record that we got to was about a little over four trillion during the Great Recession. We had never even been over a trillion dollars before the Great Recession, and we sure as heck hadn't been over 4.2 trillion. The Fed, with no fiscal stimulus, we could see a Fed grow their balance sheet to 10 or $12 trillion by the spring of next year. So this is where another form of inflation comes in. There's assets and commodity inflation, and we don't have a lot of that, although that's starting to tick up. Um, and if you're buying homes or you're renting apartments, you know the things we spend money on every day are going up a lot. Um, but you can also have currency devaluation that causes inflation. So um, pay attention to that. The uh, good news for you guys is what the Fed is spending money on, they are loading up on mortgage-backed securities, um, whether it's on the multifamily side or the single family side, they're just not going to let another housing crisis develop like 2008 and 2009. So look at that. A year ago, they only had about $574 billion and they already have over $2 trillion. So the Fed isn't slowing down. That's good liquidity for what you do. It's not great, you know, if you're in the hotel or other commercial sectors. So let's look at the at the um, where the where the debt flows is because where does our commercial real estate debt come from? So this slide on set thirteen is the debt pie. So on the left side, this is not good news. We're back to where we were in two thousand eight and nine, and where we were was that the banks held over half of all commercial real estate debt. So if you look at life companies, only twelve percent securitization, CMBS only nine percent. Look at even the GSEs, the, the all at FHFA, it's only eight percent of all the debt. So there's a massive amount of commercial real estate in the banks. So as goes COVID in our economy is going to go the banks in this situation. So, um, and on the right, I broke out the life companies. The good news for the life companies is they don't have a lot of lodging, but people don't think of life companies as a major holder of multifamily debt. And it's uh, tied with office as their biggest piece of their pie. So very important source of capital um, for our industry. All right. I'm full of lots of good and bad news here tonight. So guess what's back? bank failures. So we started, I was at the Fed last time we went through this 2005 to 10. We had over 500 bank failures. We've already had four this year. You can see how they played out by year. Here's the bank fail list that we've had. The last bank failure in Texas was back in May of 2019. But you can see these are in small markets that aren't where we're seeing the big GDP and COVID impact. Kansas Florida, yes. West Virginia, Nebraska, not so much. So our community banks and stuff are, are really quite weak here. So how do you know where your banks stand, where your banking industry is, and all of that type of stuff? There's a thing that you guys helped create called the Texas Ratio. And what it does is it looks at banks. Uh, RBC Capital Markets maintains this for every bank in the country. And it's a percentage of your capital that's tied up in bad loans. And so you want this ratio very low. You definitely want it below 5%. And as it creeps up, 
10, 20, 30% or more, you begin to have lots of problems in your banking sector. And you might have a visit on a Friday afternoon from the FDIC. So, um, you know, this is one to pay attention to. I broke out your Texas banks here and you can see, you know, pretty well dispersed across, you know, Dallas and even small markets like Waco and Corpus Christi um, in the bigger markets, yours have really low ratios. In fact, you can see several there at the top, you know, that are, you know, one and a half billion, two billion dollar banks like North Dallas Bank and Trust. They have zero, they have no problem credits. The reason I point this out is if you have a client that's got to do a rehab or is looking at, you know, needing a, you know, a construction or bridge facility, now is the time to be diversifying your banking relationships. You can't solely rely on the, on the FHFA and the GSC market. You may need a bank to bridge you through a process or your clients. So my advice to clients and everybody today is diversify your banking relationships. You, you may need, need those. And so this Texas ratio helps you know who's weak and worst. You have some risky banks that are well above 5% too in Texas. All right, so this was a piece that I wrote that was um, recently published um, in I think Biz Journals about a week ago, a little over a week ago, right before um, Thanksgiving. And if whatever you wanna know about the Texas ratio is packed into this article. The link is there, really good piece. It goes into how it got started, who maintains it, where you can go for all kinds of things, what the historic benchmarks are. So I'll, I'll leave that to you if you're curious about that. All right. So another question I had that I did not too long ago was, I believe it was by uh, Cornette. They asked me to talk about, you know, how should we think about the, the pandemic's impact on commercial real estate when kind of all the shoes are falling at once. That's kind of what it feels like. So I've kind of talked about the economy and GDP. I'm going to focus primarily on housing because that's what you guys, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the other commercial property types. So let's dive into that. So there's actually some good news here. So I got all my bad news out of the way early. So this is the latest stuff from RealPage. They do a really good job. And these are their latest numbers out this week for rent payment results. And they remain very strong, believe it or not, in Class A and B properties. It's a little more strained in Class C, and this is because we didn't get an extension of CARES bill. We didn't get all the states to extend unemployment insurance benefits. We didn't get Congress to approve letting the Fed and Treasury take the extra $400 billion they didn't spend in the CARES bill and put it towards things like unemployment insurance. So the end of December, all the extended unemployment insurance benefits run out. So it's going to get really interesting. We're going to see these numbers change, I think, pretty dramatically in, in, uh, in January. But right now, 90% of households are, are paying their rent. And uh, that was through November November 20th. You can see that um, they're off in some big markets. So Portland and Seattle and Las Vegas. We mentioned Las Vegas, one of the two states, and Nevada, the two states most impacted by COVID. Look at your West Coast markets and the inclusion of like San Jose and California and LA. Look at New York and what it's been through. These are the entities that are really strained. They're Restaurants are shut down like there's a story tonight. A, a pub owner in Staten Island tried to open up and he got arrested and the whole place is going nuts in, in protest over it. So good news is for right now, people are paying their rent. Here's where it gets sobering. So TREP, some of you may follow the TREP data. All of your GSC loans get securitized for the most part. And the overall delinquency rate in securitized loans has been improving. I've uh, been doing that for five, almost five consecutive months. Uh, you see in multifamily, uh, it's at only 3%, but that's up pretty substantially over September and October. And look at the look at the footnote and the caveats in the red font below. So TREP's telling us that this this modest you know um, improvement in the delinquency rate and the, and the rise in multifamily is the beginning of what we're going to see. That the forbearance programs have really disrupted what these numbers really are. So I will I will tell you that you're probably going to see more challenging underwriting uh, in January and February as these numbers rise. They're not going to stay this low into the first part of next year. Good news today, um, I guess, is FHFA extended the foreclosure and eviction moratorium to the end of January. So we didn't get a fiscal bill deal done. Um, we know unemployment runs out here in December, the extended benefits. So they're trying to intervene and the Fed said, bring your Bring your loans on, we'll buy them. So FHA is extended again to January 31. One of the questions we're going to have to answer in next year, the first or second quarter, is how what what don't we know about how forbearance programs are going to end? Whether it's single family or multifamily homes, 
I'm in the camp that people that have been on six, nine, or 12 months of rent forbearance are not going to be able to come current within 90 days. That's what's required in the current programs. So I'm, I'm in the camp that probably rent uh, forbearance is going to turn into rent forgiveness and property owners are going to take the hit because, you, as you know, everybody that owns an apartment project, you're an evil rich person. You have capital. You can absorb it. You suck it up, right? So the underwriting and how we think about how we write that off, how we charge it, how we deal with rent forbearance, what do the appraisers do, how do they factor it in? We don't have any of those answers. The Fed hasn't given good guidance. FHFA hasn't given good guidance on how do you treat forbearance right now. And so it's being interpreted in many different ways. But anyway, for now, everybody can have a good Christmas. We'll wait and see what happens. Maybe Valentine's Day won't be so loving when there's not another extension. All right. Real Capital Analytics does a really good job with their CPPI index. That's the Commercial Property Price Index. And so this just um, came out, their November uh, report for October. And you can see on, on apartments, the price appreciation is phenomenal. So if you look at the three years, apartment properties on average are up over 30%. If you look at the year over year, over 7%. percent Want you guys and your clients take that to the bank every year? And just over the one month, it's up almost 1%, eight-tenths of a percent. So nationally, commercial real estate's hanging in there. Multifamily is, is doing okay, up 7.2% year over year. Industrial's a little bit stronger. So the value is going up. People are paying the rent. FHA is extending rent for more parents. Get every doggone deal closed and financed by the end of the year. These numbers will change and impact the underwriting. I think in the first quarter. So another thing that we're going to have to think about that could be opportunistic is how do we deal with housing affordability? It didn't it didn't go away during COVID. It intensified, and so I think there's two areas we're going to see. One, adaptive reuse is going to step in and help us look at commercial assets. Could be you know malls or closed hotels, a myriad of projects that could become affordable housing projects through adaptive reuse. There's another one, though, in the lower left corner, and you guys have, might have encountered some of this. It's four rent subdivisions. So I've got broken down here on the left. There's a big company. The second largest in the country is American Homes for Rent, and they do a lot of this stuff in Texas. And so they're building four rent single family subdivisions. So I grabbed a picture of what one of these looks like in Spring, Texas, and these are nice. This is going to become shadow inventory that's going to have to be considered in multifamily underwriting, just like foreclosed houses became a piece of shadow inventory that you had to understand and, and uh, talk about back in 2010, 11, and 12. But how are these things going to play out? How are they going to be financed? Is there going to be permanent markets for it? The answer is right now, securitization has been doing a lot of these uh, for rent single family uh, subdivisions in securitization. So this could be a whole new opportunity to look at. And you're right in the heart of it in Texas. It's, it's going very well. They hadn't figured it out in California yet. All right. This is another example of showing where active for rent subdivisions are occurring. So if you look at the if you look at the yellow dots, which are apartments, and that the green are where you've got active markets with uh, for rent single family subdivisions. And so you can see you've got across the southern United States, this is where it's taking root. And we're not the part of the country that has the housing affordability problem. So as people pack up and leave the Northeast and they leave the West Coast and they come South, Southwest, Southeast, and even in the mid part of the country, this is another alternative. It's a real thing. It's not a, a freak kind of fad that's gonna go away. A uh, good friend of mine you may know, um, I've heard of John Burns uh, on the West Coast. He does a real good residential real estate consulting. He just put a piece out on this on uh, Build for Rent and how it's really a real thing. He's now actually tracking it. And one of the numbers in his latest report that he has out there is that they estimate that there are 16.4 single family rental homes nationally. And that number would be larger you know, than anybody would have imagine and they're now about the same number of rental homes as apartment homes so think about that that we have as many single family rental homes as we do apartment homes in this country and you know before tonight how I many how many of you would have really um you know thought that but um john's counting the numbers so there's his link office i'm going to touch base on real quickly because it's important to housing if we don't go back to the cities what is that high-end, class A, high-density multifamily, what does it rent for? How do they deal with getting current on rent forbearance? I think the I'm very bullish on the suburbs, and I'm not so bullish 
on the urban areas. The New Yorks, the Philadelphia, the Boston, the LA, the San Francisco, even the Denver markets. I don't think they can um, sustain rent increases. I don't think they can come through the rent forbearance without um, being scathed. And so if companies continue to say this work remote model works pretty good and we're gonna keep with it and let people work remote and maybe have satellite offices in the suburbs, that has huge implications for housing, whether it's single family or multifamily. So this is a study that KPMG recently completed. They surveyed over 300 CEOs and the, the respective CEOs indicated or said that they're gonna continue or expand work remote work even after COVID. And we got major companies like REI in the West Coast, Seattle area said, we just completed a new headquarters building and we're not moving in. And they just sold it to Amazon or Nike or one of those, uh, one of the tech companies that was near one of its campus buildings, uh, I think it was Amazon. So I don't think the work remote model is going away. I think this is a watershed event and that has huge implications for housing demand, housing prices, rent prices, rent demand, all of that type stuff. And the, and the tenants, like my millennial daughters, that we're all for let's move to the city and have experiential lifestyles they're gone and they're not coming back anytime soon this is a little bit like 9 11 it may take us years to really get used to coming back to the dense urban cities and public transportation and they've said look at we're in the suburbs we got to work from home we can't make it work in a one-bedroom apartment we need a two-bedroom maybe a three-bedroom if i have a roommate and we share an office and so the value add opportunity in the suburban markets, particularly in the South, I think are gonna be um, incredible. Retail, we need to think about retail because what is a community like if there's no restaurants that are open, if there's no retail, there's no shopping, there's no click it and pick up uh, facilities or a Walmart near them. So we gotta be paying attention to what's happening. One of the entities is becoming a big bellwether for tenants that are looking to rent or people to buy homes at the under $300, $100,000 price point is the proximity to a Dollar General store. So we'll add another thousand general Dollar General stores. They've partnered with FedEx and FedEx is closing all of its stores and they're putting FedEx retail outlets for package pickup and delivery inside Dollar General stores. And they've introduced a new concept to go a little bit upscale called Pop Shelf. They're introducing it in Nashville. They're gonna roll out 30 of these by the spring of next year. And they're looking at Tennessee, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Texas, um, Huntsville, Alabama is their key markets. So be thinking about what's happening with retail, where you're underwriting. We've already closed over 8,000 stores this year. We'll close a record over 12 to 15,000. And the value of a community, its rent, its offering, its schools, all of that type stuff, it really takes a cue from how well the retail is. So the good news is we've opened over 3,000 stores. So even though we've closed already 8,000, we've opened 3,000, but we gotta pay attention to what's happening with retail. This is a piece that I just had published in Bloomberg for the CCIM Institute, where we looked at adaptive reuse and we're looking at theaters. Theaters aren't coming back, COVID destroyed them. And so how are we gonna repurpose theaters? Could these become housing opportunities? Well, if they're, Theaters that were built in the last 20 or 25 years, they have more stadium seating. It's not the concrete floors laid in weird configurations. Um, you can remove all of that. They can become last mile warehouses. They can become just like loft warehouses that become uh, multifamily. So this is a piece you might wanna read. We talked about some of those examples in there, um, but adaptive reuse is gonna be very real in terms of solving the affordable housing situation. I wanna close on one last point and it's ESG, environmental social governance. So our industry is way behind on ESG. We don't understand it. We don't have our websites with ESG content on it. And what you may not realize is that your company may already be pre-screened out from consideration. You're gonna see FHFA say that we'll only underwrite with entities and mortgage brokers that are pro ESG and that you have that on your website. So I pulled here an example, I'm on a board for a public REIT, it's an industrial REIT, and to show you how we're trying to deal with it because we were getting bad ESG scores that was affecting our capital flowing into our REIT because our primary tenant was FedEx. And they think FedEx and warehouses are evil. They cut down all the trees, they pave over everything, and they have lots of diesel trucks coming into the property. So when we had to start telling them the story that FedEx is not a bad, evil entity, I think I've got that 
No, I took it out of here for you. So FedEx has what's called a global citizenship report. I took it out of this one. It's a great read. You know, they've got, they've grown by 96%, but they've cut carbon emission, carbon CO2 emissions by over 40%. They have 13 directors and over seven are women and minorities. Over a quarter of all of their management worldwide are women and minorities. They walk an ESG model better than any Wall Street investment banker or entity like JP Morgan or BlackRock that are preaching ESG to us or tech companies from the West Coast. But here's an example of kind of some of the content. If you don't have this or have an ESG portal on your on your website with content, um, you're at a real disadvantage. You may not realize how much work and opportunity you're missing. So we even put, we moved our headquarters last year into one of the biggest uh, adaptive use projects in the United States. It was the former Bell Labs project in Holmdale, New Jersey. It has the largest photovoltaic solar roof in the world. And so most over half of all of the energy for our tenants and ourselves included comes from solar here. So when we started telling this story and we had this on our website, our ESG scores improved dramatically and our, our capital coming into our REIT improved. To show you how real this is, this is a recent rating agency done by Kroll. Kroll just rated the Hertz vehicle bonds. Uh, Hertz is in bankruptcy, as you know. And at the bottom of the review, they had these ESG considerations. And part of the overall rating on Hertz, and any public company now by the rating agencies, has an ESG consideration. So if you don't think this has real roots and is going to impact our industry and impact your business, I'm here to tell you, you, you don't know what you don't know in terms of what you're losing in business. So homework assignment number one between now and the holidays is make sure you have an ESG section in your website and that tells stories. So if you do a financing of a value rehab and they improve the energy efficiency by 20%, man, note that. Note that how you guys are helping arrange financing for projects that are becoming more energy efficient. Or if it was something that was in a in a neighborhood that had a high percentage of you know, of ethnic diversity or challenges or poverty, but you finance that and made that happen, you have got to tell that story. So um, I'll close on this and take some questions. These are kind of, I, I work eight days a week. That's what we do, right? When we're in the industry, we don't get a, we don't even get Sunday off. We work eight days a week. So that's the motto I grab for my Red Shoe Economics company. But these are kind of the eight things I have on my radar going into next year. Employment, I'm looking at the job cuts numbers. That's the forward indicator. And it doesn't look pretty right now. Housing. It's all about what what we don't know in terms of we don't know what we don't know in terms of what's going to play out in forbearance. The numbers look good right now. They're all being masked. Get every deal done. Why it doesn't matter between now and, and maybe January. But I'm telling you, in January and February, when we get those numbers in, Trep and RCA and and uh, and the others are already telling us it's going to be ugly and it's going to be harder to get these deals financed. There's going to be less debt. You're going to require more equity. So get the deals done now. The Texas ratio, we need to pay attention to that to understand how healthy our banks are. Half of all of our CRE debt, including multifamily, is in banks. And so as this plays out, it's really going to play out in banks. Diversify your banking and your capital relationships. Remember that life companies, the multifamily is tied with office for the biggest piece of their portfolio. So life companies are going to have some multifamily needs. Um, retail, I think the adaptive reuse element is going to be very important for our housing uh, office I talked about, state fiscal health, huge. I can't understate the importance of knowing what's happened in the counties and MSAs. When I was at the Fed and we saw 74 counties and cities file bankruptcy, we went into all the banks and we told them that we wanted to see in every underwriting, we wanted to see a fiscal analysis of the county and the city. And we wanted to know if the bank had a clue as to what they were going to do if that if that um, city or county filed bankruptcy. And we had a hit list. We knew who was vulnerable. And, um, and the banks may have to sit on these deals. You can't refinance these deals. The, the regulators will only let the, the, you extend the loan. No new equity, no new value add, no new origination type stuff. It's just, you know, deal with what you've got. Logistics, I'm a big fan of, and ESG I talked about. So why don't I stop there, and I'll stop screen sharing and see what you guys want to talk about. Hey, Casey, this is James. Um, appreciate you sharing those slides. Learned a ton there. I got some questions from the audience uh, while you're talking and sort of beforehand. So I'm going to, I'm going to ask you some questions and sure. I'll consider this more like a rapid fire. So if you, if we've already covered it, just say that and we'll just keep going. Um, but maybe 30 seconds to a minute on each one of these uh, questions, if you don't mind. Sure. So Henry asks, 
problems in the banking system. Is there anything specific to the the system wide, or is it more bank by bank? So it is systemic. So remember, we went into 2020 with a bank CRE concentration problem. So the banks were already under pressure in January to start cooling it on more CRE lending. The one exception probably was multifamily because it can be so layered off to FHFA and HUD and Freddie and Fannie and the feds buying all that stuff. So multifamily is probably the exception, but for office and retail and the other commercial property types, it's horrible. The other thing they're worried about is a lot of banks, particularly community banks, do a lot of C&I lending, commercial and industrial. These are your businesses like restaurants and hotels and senior housing, those businesses, assisted living facilities. And those things are primarily, um, really they're discovering again that the primary collateral is the real estate. When the business goes, all you've got is the real estate. When they start transferring those problem C&I loans to the real estate department and adding them into their real estate concentration bucket, it's going to get real ugly. So even though the banks may, you know, have a good argument for continuing and doing origination in multifamily because of their CRE concentration ratio, and that's 100% of their capital in either land or 300% in overall real estate. So it doesn't matter if it's, you know, 299% multifamily and only 1% other bad stuff. If you go over that 300% number, you're shut down. So um, okay. you need to pay attention to that concentration ratio. And I think the C&I lending with all the restaurants and the businesses that have been affected by COVID are going to tip that even worse. Um, so that's why I say diversify your relationships. Casey, what, what happens when a bank goes under? If you can explain that quickly, like what yeah. happens? <laughs> it's a pretty smooth process. The Fed's got it down pat. They come visit you on a Friday afternoon when nobody's paying attention <laughs> and they shut it down and they insure the deposits and that's come down. You remember back in the Great Recession, they raised them out from 250 per account to way above that. So if you're here's a lesson. If you're a business, you may need to pay attention to what's happening in your banking because you're only insured up to 250,000. If you're accumulating the payroll and it's the last Friday of the month, and the Fed, FDIC comes in and closes that bank, you're only insured for 250000 You may have a million-dollar payroll that suddenly is only insured for 250000 So it's a reason to pay attention. But they come in on Friday. They sell the assets to another bank. There are always lots of bidders and buyers for this stuff, but it might be 30 40 50 cents on the dollar that they can pick these up. So it's, it's uh, for those that can step in and buy or they want to be in a market, it's a good opportunity. You pick up the branches, uh, you pick up the deposits, um, you pick up some loans. It's kind of like the old RTC days. You get a grab bag and then you get to figure it out. But it happens very quickly, very smoothly. The customers don't know much. They reopen on Monday. They change the signs or you know put a banner over it within a matter of days. Mm-hmm. Everybody's notified by email. Your accounts still work. So it's a pretty smooth process. But... If you have a loan that's in process or a loan commitment, all that type stuff comes to a screech and halt. It's all voided. It's dead. Start all over again. That's why you need to pay attention. All right. Um, number two, Paul asks, if the economy gets stronger, will the Fed backtrack on its lower interest rates for the next three years, it's, which is sort of what it's been telling us in its uh, memos? I think there's a high risk of that because um, so we don't know what's going to happen with the change in the administration. But I think my fear is we're going to see more fiscal and monetary intervention rather than truly fixing the economy. You know, whether you like Trump or not, he understood business. He made things really he got rid of really regulation more than anything else. We're going back to the era of lots of regulation. All of the administration appointees that he's talking about, these are all career government people. I mean, you bring John Kerry back, you bring in Janet Yellen. I mean, I wish we could get some people that are not Social Security eligible in age, in government, you know, younger, youthful, energetic. So I think the Fed is not at risk of doing that, um, at least in the first half or maybe all of 2021. But I sure think it could happen in 2022. Here's here's where I'll tell you something to pay attention to. Pay attention to treasury bond auctions. It's really boring, but you can go on, you know, Bloomberg or you know any of these sites to give you alerts on, you know, 10-year treasury bond auctions. So many of you may remember before Thanksgiving, it was the Tuesday before Veterans Day, and the 10-year treasury shot up to 97 basis points. And everybody's like, what the hell went wrong? What went wrong is on that Tuesday before Veterans Day, 
uh, the treasury market went to the market with the largest 10 year bond auction ever in our history. And guess who didn't show up? Most of the rest of the world. And so the Fed and Treasury had to step back in. There wasn't enough counter bid to sell all the bonds. So they had to start bidding it up to get people to come back in. And so this is part of that unintended consequences of what the Fed's been doing in printing money with Treasury is the, the rest of the world is saying, we know you're a fiat currency. We know you're printing money. You're no different than Argentina or Brazil in prior debt crises. And if you don't knock it off, we're not buying your bonds. And you could see the bond market tell us that the treasury rates, the 10 year goes to two or 300 basis points. So the Fed can really only influence short term rates. They really can't do long term. That's the market. And we all we all better be paying attention to that and watching those 10 year options. So I think the 10 year options by the bond market could tell us more than what the Fed does with interest rates. They're almost irrelevant for what we need, the kind of capital we need for long-term financing. All right. Clive asks, will multifamily asset values appear to be immune to the pandemic? When do you expect to see values go down, if at any time? So watch what happens on starts, and they aren't picking up. I mean, we're seeing modest increase, but you know, a million five units, million three units, you know, where one third is still multifamily and two thirds is single family. It's not enough to meet demand. I mean, we're, you know, we're dealing with 10 years where the bankers and, and uh, you know, the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau said no money for anybody that builds, you know, something that looks like a house or a subdivision. So we've had several years of building demand while we created jobs and we created households and you don't alleviate that in one year. We, it is going to take literally two or three years to begin to make a dent in the unsatisfied demand. So I don't see housing prices moderating or going negative anytime soon. I don't see, you know, rents and multifamily values declining. Here's my one caveat. Remember in the previous, one of the previous slides I talked about where A and B have kind of held up and the C has not done so well because you have a, you have a lower income uh, type of tenant that is more impacted by COVID. If these rent forbearance programs turn into rent forgiveness, or even if they don't, and the tenants have to pay back six, nine, 12 months of, of rent forbearance, do you think they can handle a rent increase? If you've got six or nine months of rent forbearance that you have to repay over a six to 12 month period of time, the rules right now are 90 days you're looking at like 10 to 20% rent increases. So the ability, if you're performing in or your clients are performing in big rent increases, I don't think they're gonna materialize in B and C properties or even A and B properties in urban cities because the tenants are gonna be struggling to repay rent forbearance. And the only fix of that I think is rent um, forgiveness. And if they do that, then the property owners have a one time big uptime capital hit that's going to, you know, re really be impactful. So that's why I say we really don't know what we don't know about rent forbearance, how it's going to play out. Is it going to become forgiveness? And what is its implications for rent increases? And I think that's the piece. Nobody's connecting the dots on that. You know, I just don't think there's going to be rent pricing power in the urban areas or the areas or projects that have a lot of rent forbearance. And I'll give you a scary statistic. One in four American households right now, are in rent forbearance, mortgage forbearance, or delinquent on their mortgage. We haven't seen those kinds of numbers since the Great Depression. So for all the celebratory news from the National Association of Realtors and everybody about how great housing is, there's an entire quartile that can't pay their rent, can't pay their mortgage, or delinquent, whether it's in mortgage forbearance or delinquency. And those numbers have yet to play out. And when we pull those support mechanisms out, like mortgage forbearance and an eviction and foreclosure uh, moratoriums, that's when we really see what happens here. And I think that happens sometime late spring to summer and fall next year. That's when we're gonna understand it. So I would encourage your customers to have built up reserves, to be thinking, can I weather a rent forbearance becoming a, a, a rent forgiveness? You know, and what do I do about shadow inventory? And I think the safest place is gonna be in the suburbs, a value add in the suburbs. And I wouldn't wanna be doing a lot in in big urban cities that are dependent on public transportation, like in New York, or San Francisco, or in LA. I'd, I'd wanna be in the Carolinas, Texas, Tennessee, Utah, you know, Georgia, Florida. Those are the places I think are gonna be safe. All right, uh, Darren asks, what keeps you at night in regards to the future of commercial real estate? 
<laughs> the Fed. <laughs> they scare the hell out of me. <laughs> Think about this. We never asked in the in the debates, the presidential and vice presidential debates, who your appointment would be to succeed Jay Powell. His term is up next February, a year from now. And so, you know, I think with Biden, it's more inclined he'll be reappointed. I think Trump would have fired Powell. Powell is a guy that's just going to print money. The old graphics we had from the Great Recession where the helicopter money and the Fed was dropping money, Yellen is part of that. She's a co-pilot on helicopter money. Yellen is in Treasury and Powell at the Fed are going to destroy the dollar. It's just going to print money like hell. We're a fiat currency. There's unintended consequences for it. And if the long-term bond market, it says, we're not buying your 10-year debt, and we want 5 or 6%, even if the Fed has interest rates at a quarter or 50 basis points, the Fed can't change that. That is the real bond market. That's why the Fed is buying so much mortgage-backed securities. They're trying to make sure that we don't have another housing crisis like we did last time. Because if you throw housing in the ditch on top of everything else, we're in a heap of trouble. So I'd pay attention to those 10-year treasury auctions and see what happens at 10-year treasury. I think we're still up there in that 85, 90 basis point range, but think of where we were. I mean, just a number of months ago, we were down in the 50 basis point range. I mean, that's just think about that. Someone saying your 10-year treasury doubled uh, in, in a matter of 90 to 100 days. Um, that would scare the hell out of us and disrupt every every potential deal we had at any other time. So. That's what scares uh-huh. me is the Fed. And I think the other one is the Georgia Senate runoff elections. I'm a believer in divided government. I don't trust any one party to make things right. <laughs> Whether it's right or left, they all get out of control and screw up. I think divided government is healthy. And if Georgia, these Senate elections, it's, it's just total corruption what's happening here. Each party is importing phony voters to come in and vote. We have early voting starting this um, Saturday. Uh, you only have to be a resident for 30 days. So as long as by Friday, you re-register where you live to be here in Georgia, you can vote in our election. And so on the Democrat side, they already have hundreds of thousands of people that don't live here that have already come and registered this week for the next 45 days or 60 days that are going to vote in our elections. It's just, it's unconscionable what's happened. Our, our election process is badly broken and every single state needs to make um, the secretary of state one of the most important positions that is scrutinized that we elect for. We've taken it for granted and our different um, states have really done a bad job. You look at where we are in Georgia compared to, I mean, you guys in Texas, even Florida this time around, we're able to count their votes and have integrity and do all that type of stuff. And what we've got going is just a complete cluster. We're, we're, we're like Barney Fife and Mayberry in terms of figuring out how to vote. It's a joke. We better take our electoral system very seriously or we'll lose it. So the Fed and I guess voting in the Georgia Senate runoffs have me awake a lot. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, Stephen asks, can cap rates go any lower and still make sense? Uh, they can, and I'll tell you why. There's just so much capital. Remember, capital's looking for yield right now. And compared to where they've been, a 4% cap rate looks really good compared to you know, not even a quarter point from the Fed, or you look at treasury bonds below 1% and even corporate bonds, risky corporate debt um, is, you know, sub 3% rate. So when you look at commercial real estate that has a tangible asset, it has cash flow, it's a hedge against inflation, it's a hedge against currency monkey business, um, it looks very attractive. And so I think for really good value add, suburban stuff. You look at something, say, in suburban Charlotte, suburban Raleigh, North Carolina, suburban Greenville, South Carolina, suburban San Antonio, you know, suburban Phoenix or Tucson or Salt Lake City, the capital, it needs yield. And if they can find a nice deal that they feel comfortable with at four or five cap rates, get ready. It's coming. I think we can see in industrial multifamily, we can see a lot of cap rate compression, maybe another 100 basis points. I've seen it in our in our REIT environment on an industrial REIT. We've seen cap rates that shot up to six and a half, seven percent in the early part of COVID go back below the record numbers we were competing with at the end of last year. We're sub five cap rates now for an e-commerce warehouse. It's, un, it's just un, it's ridiculous. But when we can borrow money at two and a half percent, and we can buy at a four and a half to five cap rate, man, the, the numbers just make sense. And so the ability to lock up that that permanent debt money at these low rates means that cap rates can come down a lot. They, they're not done. They're coming down. All right. How will the Biden administration affect multifamily? 
Good question. Again, I put it in that we don't know what we don't know. So I think one question has to be answered is what's the composition of the Senate? If the two Senate seats in Georgia go Democrat, the Democrats can do anything they want. And so Katie, bar the doors. I think rent forbearance goes to rent forgiveness. I think the Fed prints more money. I think we go into a fiscal wreck. So, you know, we, we got to understand that, you know, fiscal discipline creates a good economy. And I, I worry that if there's not a check and balance that we could really be put in a ditch really quickly. We forget. I was, I was around. My father was a ski resort developer when Jimmy Carter was elected in 1976 after Gerald Ford filled out Nixon's Watergate term from 74 to 76. And everybody thought, nice guy, you know, submarine commander, nuclear sub commander, Jimmy Carter, great guy. I know him personally, do things with him, but horrible on a domestic economy. Did, didn't understand economics at all and put the damn thing in the, the worst ditch with a Paul Volcker come in as Fed that takes interest rates to 21% in less than five years. These things can happen really quickly if you don't have discipline and checks and balances. So I'm hoping that his talk about bringing us together and being more in the middle can be sustained. But when you look at the pressures within the Democrat party to go extreme left, it's just as severe as on the Republican party, it's to go extreme right. And so if there's not that check and balance, I think this thing could, could end up being something like a Jimmy Carter presidency. And I'm, I'm worried just if the guy's healthy and can make it. So, you know, you got to be thinking about parallel here. What would a Kamala Harris president do uh, in a White House do? Because um, I, I really fear for the first time in my life, more so than even Ronald Reagan, that, you know, we could we could have elected somebody that's not going to fulfill his term from a health standpoint. So we, we better understand all of these tentacles. There's consequences to elections. Remember what Trump gave us. He gave us that 2017 tax act, whether you like him or not, it was the single best Christmas gift that ever happened to our real estate industry. And most of that is gonna be unwound. And so if there's not a checks and balances, everything that we benefited from, maybe did too much we got, um, all of that I think gets unwound to pay for uh, the, other, the other agenda that they wanna put forward. Well, Marshall asks, commercial real estate market, let's say maybe in five years, maybe two or three key items that are different from today. So I think go back to the 1950s when we saw the GIs come back after World War II in the late 40s and they said, we're not going to the suburb, we're not going to the city, we're going out to the suburbs. Everybody moved inland from the coast and they moved out to the suburbs. And I think we're at that same kind of thing right now where, you know, I don't ever want to go back to an office. I don't want to commute again. I don't want to go back to 20 trips at the airport to the Atlanta most infected airport in the world. Again, I kind of like this technology. I like fewer travel trips. There's ways like you've been doing with breakout rooms that are very effective and, and we can do things. I, I just don't want to go back to what I was doing and how I was doing work the last five or 10 years. And I think a lot of Americans say, if I don't have a commute, I don't have as big a dry cleaning bill. I don't have to pay for parking downtown. I don't have to take public transportation. I don't have gas. I can wear my sweatpants underneath my suit tonight. <laughs> I really did put some dress pants on, you know, and I can make it home for kids events. And, you know, even though I'm working more hours right now, I'm able to have breakfast with my 10 year old son. I'm able to take him for a bike ride at lunchtime for a break. Uh, I'm home for dinner. I'm not on an airplane. I'm not calling in. I'm aware of what's going on at home. I don't think a lot of us are going to change from that. So I think when we look five years out, I think office is going to be the asset class that was most impacted. Um, we're not going back to the big urban cities. If you look at how you go to an office building in a high rise building today, I just did a study for a major bank, how long it would take to get their employees into their 30 to 50 story towers. It would take two and a half hours in the morning and two and a half hours in the afternoon when only you can only put four in an elevator cab at a time. It just doesn't work. And if now you have to space everything out and you have less density, the value of that real estate, what I pay in rent, it all goes down. The value of, of office real estate is going to be repriced. And I think that retail is actually going to come out of this pretty well. That I think most of us, the model we're going to see for online commerce is not Amazon vans and Amazon Mercedes vans coming through our neighborhoods. It's going to be more click it and pick up where we order and we feel more secure just going through a drive through lane and picking our stuff up. We can do it when we want, when it's convenient. We're going to see just tremendous change in how we do retail, but I think it comes through. I think adaptive reuse is going to present tremendous opportunities to recycle real estate. 
I think multifamily, we have a housing affordability crisis in this country that's not going away for years. It's gonna take us years. It's gonna take manufactured housing, for rent subdivisions, adaptive reuse. It's gonna take a lot of elbow grease. So I feel good about multifamily. I feel great about e-commerce and warehouses. Um, you know, FedEx recently stated that they forecast that it would take till 2025 before we had 100 million packages that were delivered during the holiday season. They're going to probably hit that this year. And they only have capacity to handle 80 million. And they know already they have booked to handle 85 million packages. So industrial and logistics and e-commerce is going to explode. And that's going to explode in the suburbs where the jobs are going to be here in the suburbs. So I'm really bullish. I think we're going to look back and say, wow, that whole trend about experiential learning and high density and high rents and, you know, being poor, living in the city, how that went from cool to why is everybody living in the suburbs again? And just like the regional mall solved the problem for the GIs going to the suburbs, I think it's something like that that's going to solve it for us in the suburbs. So I think we're going to look back and say, what the hell happened to the urban cities? The suburbs are back. All right. Moving in that direction, but maybe even a little bit further out is secondary and tertiary markets. Jim asks, uh, what are you seeing happening in pricing in the secondary and tertiary markets, maybe an hour, two hours, three hours away from, let's say, Dallas? Yeah, um, wonderful question. Um, I, I see all upside. So I'll give you some examples. Look at a Milwaukee from Chicago. Great market. Look at um, in the Carolinas, look at a Columbia, South Carolina. Carolina, you know, is an option to Charlotte or even a Greenville, Spartanburg. Look at a San Antonio, which is, you know, really, a, you know, a, a secondary type market. Look at a Tucson, Arizona, not too far from Phoenix. Look at Salt Lake City, you know, only a million, a little over a million in population. But, you know, they're, they're attracting 100 businesses a week out of the West Coast right now. Just tremendous growth going into the Utah and Salt Lake markets. So I see nothing but upside. And here's what's behind it. Corporate America has realized that all of that expensive labor costs that they had in San Francisco and Seattle and Silicon Valley, maybe even Austin, you know, Denver, you know, New York, Boston, Philadelphia, they don't need to pay those wages. They can find that skilled workforce working remote really effectively in very cost affordable secondary markets. And so we're already seeing that happen happen where the labor pool, the skilled labor pool is expanding. And so um, really university towns near, you know, in secondary markets, not too far from a primary market. So think of like in Athens, Georgia, proximity to Atlanta. Think of um, University of Alabama, not too far from Birmingham. You know, look at the, the suburban Nashville market. Look, look at the importance of a Vanderbilt in a suburban Nashville type of market. So I see really great upside because companies can actually cut skilled labor costs by 20 or 30 percent by having that workforce work remote in more affordable secondary markets. And guess what the workforce gets? They really didn't want to go to New York or San Francisco and be poor and miserable. And they like being close to family. They love, you know, being in an affordable place where they can own a home, maybe instead of just renting an apartment until they're 40 and wait for mom and dad to die and give them the inheritance in the house. So I'm very, very bullish. And as you notice, my top picks, when people say, well, Casey, where would you put money? Where would you invest? Number one, my, my favorite is probably Salt Lake City. Number two is San Antonio, Texas. Number three is anywhere in the Carolinas. It's just a phenomenal story. Number four, a Columbus, Ohio. Ohio State University, Columbus, Ohio exudes logistics. It was a runner-up finalist for Amazon in their HQ2 selection that is now handling all that the New York airports can't handle in terms of e-commerce and air cargo. A Tampa, Florida. I mean, I could go on, but I don't have a single big city market I really love, but I sure love a lot of the secondary markets. That's perfect. Uh, Jim, Jim is actually in Chicago, so I'm sure he loved your Milwaukee uh, <laughs> question, answer. Um, yeah, look at the Quad Cities. I mean, look at, you know, I'm doing a deal right now, helping a client in the Quad Cities, you know, and on the Illinois side, it's like a third world nation. And on the Iowa side, it's booming and you can get a loose meat sandwich and it's politically correct to even say that. <laughs> uh, Jefferson asked, future multifamily, if there is a second wave of COVID, What's the future? Well, we do have a second wave. <laughs> and <it's> people <laughs> Knowing that there is a future to, wave. Yeah. Yeah. So you're going to have every, every entity in the world, whether it's governors putting moratoriums again on evictions, the CDC one, I saw that scroll at one point in time. It's illegal. The courts will strike it down. But the debt 
and ownership entities can. Governors can do it through states of emergencies. The CDC has no legal authority to do what they're doing or what they tried to do, but governors and mayors and FHFA, they can do that. They control the debt, they control through states of emergency. So we'll see all this stuff extended, just like FHFA, FHFA did today. They kicked the can down the road. I mean, the, the first forbearance agreements were supposed to end in July, and they moved them out three months, and they moved them to, supposed to expire December. Now they move them to January. So we'll see this extended because nobody wants to see mass amounts of homeless uh, or evictions of people that are even more exposed to COVID on the streets. That's not good health practices. So we're going to kick this thing down the road. And my fear is it's the multifamily property owner that's eventually going to have to pay the price here. There's a day of reckoning coming. They better get ready for budgeting some degree of rent forgiveness. All right. I think we touched on this. I'm going to try to go a little bit faster here. Do you have a like five more minutes, Casey? Uh, yeah. We still have everyone on the line, so I appreciate everyone hanging in. Um, <laughs> this has been great. So it was, it um, was the loose meat sandwich comment in <laughs> Iowa. <laughs> well, maybe, may, I mean, maybe this is this is like a leading question here. Richard asks, so COVID-19, we had the stimulus, and you saw the the size of the Fed's balance sheet increase so much. Does that just not lead to asset inflation, though? So, like, if the Fed's balance sheet goes from seven trillion to ten trillion, is that not going to lead to asset inflation, though, for it owners? Yeah. It does. So, for commercial real estate, because again, the cost to build becomes more expensive. The co- the replacement cost goes up, whether it's to get the materials or to get the labor, and that's what people are figuring out. I don't mind paying a four cap rate or a five cap rate for a suburban nice B value add property because you can't build them anywhere near that number. You'd have to get a two cap rate to cover the deal. And it's a it's a hedge against currency inflation. And we know that banks aren't going to lend more. We know the construction process is going to be more compromised. One of the things that's happened in the last 10 years is most cities and, and counties have layered in tons more regulation for building. So that's part of why we're not seeing more construction activity. The builders said, you know, why should I take all this construction risk to assemble a million parts on a site for something less than 10% return? I'm not going to do it. I want 20%. So if you look at home builders and multifamily developers and you ask them what their true, you know, their profit margins are, they're north of 20%. So they said, if I build less and I make more money, that's what I'm going to do. So you're actually, you're absolutely right. We'll build less. People will make more margin and um, maybe we'll have a 50 year mortgage as a solution or, you know, another option, but you're absolutely right. What the fed is doing, they don't understand they're so academic in nature. It's 99.9% academic at the Fed. When I was there, they thought I was a freak in nature trying to explain industry to them. But they're, they're, you know, you've got people that have never owned a home, never bought a car, and they're writing consumer and mortgage policy on how to do things at the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau. It's insane. And so that's the audience that you have run in the place, and they don't know how this works, and they've never talked to a home builder. Or if they do, it's one maybe that, you know, you wonder why were they able to get a hold of them in the middle of the day during this type of environment, but they don't understand that what they're doing right now has long-term unintended consequences. The best example I'll give you is Richard Nixon. Got to go way back. Richard Nixon put price controls in effect to curtail inflation. He was going to solve it. Price controls would do it. He exploded inflation. So we ended up with Paul Volcker and 21% prime. What the Fed is doing by saying, I'm just going to throw money at the problem instead of letting Congress do their doggone job. Fiscal should be a congressional thing. And if they can't come to agreement, then us as the voting public should throw every damn one of them out of office until they can do fiscal responsibility. We don't even know what they're going to do in terms of um, extending the the deficit here. Um, we're facing another problem there. They can't, these guys can't agree on who gets to use the bathroom at this, you know, in, in what sequence right now. So, I'm really worried about it, and it absolutely does lead to inflation. So it's great if you own commercial real estate. If you think back to the 1970s, if you if you entered the 70s, even up to 75, 76, owning a house and owning real estate, and you made it into the 80s, and you got Reagan where you brought rates down from 21% to under 10%, you became quite wealthy. And I think we're looking at some of these same things, and it takes 20, 30, 40 years to basically redo the stupidity that we did last time. It takes that long for all the people that understood it to die and go away. Uh, I was just a teenager that was affected by a, a father that was developing ski resorts in Colorado to understand this really sucks. <laughs> 
and I'm going to learn what happened here. And um, so I'm scarred. I'm only 58, but I, I feel like I'm 88. <laughs> well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run through. We're a little over. So let me just run through some of these and see if we, we haven't touched on this. Fannie Freddie becoming private versus being a government agency. What are your thoughts on that? not going to happen, especially under a Biden administration. The Fed and Biden and all them want control. One, it's profitable, made a lot of money for them. Two, they want control of that so they can prevent another housing crisis and they can do things like rent forbearance. I, I don't see it in the near term at all. No way. Trump, okay. If Trump had been reelected, it, it might have been something that, that had some legs over his next four-year term, but it's not in the cards. What do I, Chris has this question. So I got a lot of multifamily already. What's a good diversification play to offset that high concentration? So I'd look at, you know, kind of where it is. If I've got it urban versus suburban, if it's big primary markets versus secondary markets, if it's in one region versus another, I wouldn't be afraid that I have a lot of multifamily. I'd be afraid that I have a lot of multifamily in one or two buckets, like it's more urban or it's more class A or it's in properties that have a lot of tenants with rent forbearance, that if that becomes rent forgiveness, I'd worry that if it's in big markets in urban areas like a Denver or, you know, uh, an LA or a Chicago, I, I'd be worried. I'd want to, I'd want to get that geographic and product diversification. So if I can unload some of that stuff now to a less, you know, knowledgeable <laughs> institutional money, I mean, there's dumb money out there saying I'll just buy, any multifamily at a five cap rate or five and a half cap rate, um, sell like hell and, and diversify that product out. You can still pick up good suburban value add deals right now, particularly in secondary markets that I think you could see 20, 30% property price appreciation over the next two to three years. So I look at diversified by size, by exposure and, and, um, and product type. What other commercial property type besides if you're not in multi, what would you do as like an offset? So if multi starts going down, what would go up? Well, I love industrial. You got multi and industrial. Office is always the last one to correct. It's going to be ugly. Everything coming out. They just, uh, the Commercial Real Estate Finance Council had day one or two of its meetings today, virtual. And every one of them said, oh my God, we're trying to get the hell out of office. It's going to be, it's going to reprice. It's not going to be good, but it's going to take two or three years because all the tenants will pay their rent. CBRE just produced a report that showed we had the highest amount of sublet office space available in the history of our country. It's companies that are saying, you know, you don't have to come back to work or a bank, a Wells Fargo, where we're going to lay off all these employees and we're going to use more technology. Um, so I'm not, I'm not good on office retail if it's a grocery anchored and it's a dominant one or two grocer, I might do a grocery anchor deal. I wouldn't touch much else in retail right now. I'd buy Dollar Tree or Dollar General. Um, they're non e-commerce, it's just crushing it. I'd buy a Home Depot or a Lowe's, you know, really select. But you know what? Everybody else has already figured that stuff out. The money is just flowing like mad. The multifamily advantage is it's harder to figure out the pieces right? It's more fragmented. It's more spread out. It's in more places. The e-commerce warehouses, they can only go in about 20 or 30 markets. They're going to follow the logistics infrastructure, the big markets where they can do supply chain distribution. Maybe last mile will go into some retail. The office, it's all a suburban play, but the suburban play, you don't know where the workforce is because the companies that are doing suburban office are saying, find me an old 1980 vintage suburban office park that's near my workforce. Well, where the hell is your workforce? Now I got to figure out where is that office workforce for that major company? I wouldn't touch hotels right now. I think they face a long road. Uh, it's really an industrial multifamily. The other one is you have patient capital is land. We're going to see land prices skyrocket. We didn't have much of it zoned. You couldn't get debt on it. And now we're finding we're running out of our land, whether it's for single family, whether it's for warehouses, for its multifamily. So I'd, I'd be looking at some land opportunities. All right. Let me see if there's any, maybe touch on this one while I'm going through them. Best performing class of apartments over the next five years. Suburban, probably B, B plus that you, you can take a B and move it to a B plus or an A minus. Definitely suburban. I'm not touching anything in an urban dense market. And it doesn't matter whether it's in New York, San Francisco, LA, or in Atlanta, or in, or in Orlando. I'm also not touching a Denver I'm not touching an urban downtown Phoenix. 
I, I just think those things face, they, they were overpriced, rents were too high, everybody was cramming themselves into a, a one bedroom, they now need at least two bedrooms for an office, they're going to the suburbs, they're going closer to mom and dad, they don't want to do public transportation, uh, they want green space. So I like, I really like that B model because you can either catch the falling A's or you can catch the relocating uh, entities that will, will go to a B because they need the larger unit size. Chris, or Charlie asks, largest bank that has a real potential to fail. Mm. <laughs> that might be a harder one. Um, yeah, I'd probably get sued. I, what I okay, you can, you can hold off on that one. It, it's, it's, it's one that did a, a, big, a big merger in the last three years. Um, they got a really horrible name. <laughs> uh, what, what letter, do, what letter does it start with? Maybe give us that. It starts with T. It starts a T. with T. Right? Okay, all right, explain. that's enough. That's enough. Yeah, I'll just explain why it's things I would look at in a bank. Okay. If you have a large bank that's one of the top 20 banks in the country, that is too intimidated to be regulated by one of the national regulators like the OCC or the Fed and opts to only be regulated by its buddy state bank regulator that they go play golf with. And um, they didn't have technology and they didn't have the capital and they spent money on sports stadiums instead of technology and they have a CRE concentration problem. It'd scare the hell out of me. So I'll leave it that way. I, you know, I, I think there's some, like if you look at on the extreme West Coast or in New York, that the regulators are too complex and too systemic, but there's some sacrificial regional banks that they could exercise and test out their powers on. Just think of what happened in 2008 and nine, and they said, let's let Lehman go and see what happens. I think the Fed is itching to let a regional go and see what happens. A question just came to me on back on this question. What are your thoughts on self storage and mobile home parks? So self storage, it's overbuilt, it's overpriced. It's gonna, it always is one of those boom bust type things. And believe it or not, people aren't storing stuff that are relocating. They're selling it or they're abandoning it. They don't have the money to do it. All my friends that left New York and went to North Carolina and Florida, they just left their furnished apartments with hundred thousand dollars worth of stuff because they couldn't get anybody to move it. And they, they had enough capital. They said, we'll just start all over. I love mobile home parks. So the sister REIT to the REIT that I'm on the board with, so Monmouth, their sister REIT is UMH. And go look at their recent earning numbers to tell you what's going on with manufactured housing and mobile home parks. You can't get enough of them. It is one of the options and solutions for affordable housing. We need to get beyond NIMBYism, not in my backyard and you know, let some of these nice four and five star mobile home parks go. The mobile home park industry is where the self storage industry was two, three decades ago. It didn't have institutional money, it didn't have REITs, it wasn't sophisticated, it was largely mom and pops. And the same transformation is happening with mobile homes and the, the money that's coming in and the yields that can be achieved out of them are phenomenal. If you can, if you can get one, do it. But it's, it's very hard to get a new one zone. There's a lot of barriers to entry, but man, every one is full. Even a badly run one is full. <laughs> uh, Lee asks, when is 10-year treasury going to be back at 2%? So I think the market could move it there next year by summer. I think the Fed can't control this thing. That If the Fed goes to $10 trillion on its balance sheet, you'll see a 10-year treasury really skyrocket. It could go one5 2% from its current 85, 90 range very, very quickly. We can't buy all of our own debt. We need the rest of the world to show up and we need institutions and corporations. And, you know, even the Fed can't jawbone the banks right now to go buy their, their treasury debt. Usually the, the, the Fed would give through capital rules and additional interest on their reserves incentives to show up and buy these bonds. And the Fed can't even do that now. They, the, the banks, their deposits are short on demand so they can go out maybe you know, in the two to five year range, but they can't go to the 10 year. We need institution money. We need corporate money. We need global money to buy our damn debt. And if they see what we're doing and we go to 30 or 40% of printed money in a one year, two year period, I think we're going to see that 10 year treasury up quite a bit and the Fed not be able to do a damn thing about it. Casey, I don't, I don't know if you know this, if the 10 year treasury is, is that have an impact on SOFR? Or is that run by different mechanisms? Do you know? Well, I don't. I don't know that. Okay. It does. So that's why we need to pay attention to the end of LIBOR. So it's the only option we have. And the Fed just recently issued a financial institution letter to the bank saying, "Don't write any more uh, LIBOR contracts." And right. that the only thing we have is SOFR. And guess what? The rest of the world hasn't accepted SOFR. So it's you know the GSEs created solution 
to LIBOR and the rest of the world says, we don't know if it works. So again, it's gonna be incestuous between the Fed and Treasury making it execute in our banking system. Um, so it is a huge, could have a huge impact in Freddie and Fannie. It's a great question. Very good okay. connecting of the dots. John has a question. What inning are we in? <laughs> I hate those um, <laughs> baseball innings or whatnot. I, I, that's why I use the glass half full, half empty. Who's controlling the pitcher? I see the pitcher a lot more empty than I did a year ago. And so I, I worry that, um, you know, if you don't have that full pitcher, you can't keep refilling the glass. The Fed has less in its arsenal. It's already printed a lot of money with Treasury. There's a lot less they can do. They have a lot fewer tools they can do. The banks haven't been forced to realize their credit problems yet. Those are coming in the stress test for next year and uh, things they have to deal with. So I see a lot less water in the pitcher, and I see the potential for the glass to be refilled or stay half full a lot less. I see the potential for a lot more empty and a lot more problems. All right. We're not even anywhere near the seventh inning stretch. <laughs> we're we're second or third inning. The vaccine could change a lot of that. But I think there's things that have happened here in the American psyche is going to be a lot like what happened after 9-11. We didn't go back to flying airplanes just because we created Homeland Security and TSA. It took us years to basically feel good about travel and flying again. And I think it's going to be two or three years before we get back to to feeling that way again. And every time somebody sneezes or sniffles, we're going to think, oh my God, is this COVID-20, COVID-21, COVID-22? Uh, our psyche, I look at my daughters, the millennials and the college students that I was with at University of Alabama, they are mentally scarred. We are, we are going to be doing psychological studies on our youth and what we did to them through this process. Uh, Fletch asks, What's, what would happen to multifamily if Fed's at negative interest rates? Uh, they won't do it. <laughs> they won't do it. Okay. Um, and you see, I, I don't think they go there. I just think that's a line that even Yellen understands we can't cross because then you'd see a 10 year treasury go three or 4%. It's basically saying we've given up. The Fed knows if they go negative, it's our admission that we've given up on monetary policy. We lost the battle. They won't go there. I think we hit most of those. So, Casey, thank you very much for coming on tonight. If you want to just have some final wrap up comments for the people who have hung on and, and <laughs> stayed on to hang out with us tonight. Just some final wrap up comments would be great. So you're in the right geography of the country. You're in the right property type. Don't dilly dally execute. I think we're going to, we built half a bridge from the spring to the fall in terms of fiscal and fed and all that type of stuff. And we hoped we'd have everything solved by October, November, and we don't. And so now there's no fiscal bridge probably until spring because by the time we see the new government and they do anything and figure out where the restrooms are and agree not to spit on each other, uh, it's March before money, end of March or April before money's in people's hands. So how do we go with no fiscal help for the airlines, unemployment insurance, more job cuts over two million. I think we have another million that are announced in January and February, uh, more store closings, more retail bankruptcies, you know, you look at what's going on, you know, in, in New York and shutting down the schools again. And, you know, this is worse than what we had happen in April, again, in terms of the virus. We went from 1 million COVID cases in April to over 65 million a day globally. That's mind boggling. We went from this summer when we were freaked out at 70,000 cases a day to over 150,000. This thing is not under control. And we spent a lot of money and we didn't get a lot of solutions. So I, I think we have to hope for the vaccine. I think we got a plan. You know, it's kind of like you got a kid going to college and, you know, you have a big capital event. You maybe didn't save as much as you should as far back, but you can't just give up and not save. And I think the best advice we can give to our clients, our borrowers, our property owners and ourselves is start planning for a tough time here the next four to six months. Execute on what you can. Um, be very grateful that you're in the geography you are, the property type you are. If you were in hotel or retail or office, you might as well go get a new career. <laughs> it's really going to be tough. So multifamily and industrial is where it's at. And um, be grateful for that and focus on the suburbs, focus on the secondary markets. And um, like I said, read the Dr. Seuss book, Seussisms. Hang around with good people, listen to good advice, make a plan, expect the unexpected. You know, that's that's what I'm doing in, in my own, you know, and I'm here I'm 58 and I've started a known business. I was a budget casualty at a university 
And um, uh, at 58, I said, I'm going to take the risk and be the red shoe economist and have red shoe economics. So I'm in the boat with you. This is uncertain, unchartered territory. But I made a plan to save some money. So at least I'm going to try it for a year. Hopefully I make it. <laughs> so if you, if you need a good speaker or need somebody that needs an expert witness or something, think of me. I'll be, I'll be glad to do it. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Old Capital Real Estate Investing Podcast. Please join us at oldcapitalpodcast.com to sign up for our weekly email updates. We'll see you next week for another great interview.